We did kind of create a weird, you know, our own version of a cultural revolution where the craziest people, the most censorious people could be so loud that they were able to get so many of us to shut up and not say things. And it was hard to see that it wasn't the majority of people. Welcome to the Unspeakable Podcast. I'm your host, Megan Dom. Quick note before we get started. It has to do with the unspeakeasy. I'll be quick, but I want to tell you that the co-ed retreat in Chicago, June 4th and 5th, has guest speakers. They have officially been announced. They include Nadine Strawson, prominent free speech advocate and former president of the ACLU for a really long time, until 2008 or so. So she can perhaps tell us what's happened there since. We'll also be joined by Eric Smith, who is a professor of rhetorics and the co-founder and president of Free Black Thought. Eric has been on this podcast a couple of times. And also we'll be joined by Lisa Selen Davis, the author of many books, who writes about many things, but perhaps most notably gender. And she's been on this show a couple of times to talk about that. And she will be back uh, soon. So June 4th and 5th, it's not an overnight, sorry, but it is for everyone, not just women. So go to theunspeakeasy.com and uh, check it out. Got to apply because I have to make sure you're not crazy. But other than that, everybody's welcome. <laughs> okay. My guest is Ariel Isaac Norman. Ariel is a comedian who has opened for Louis C.K., Bobcat Goldthwait, Tim Dillon, Eddie Pepitone, Maria Bamford, who's been a guest on this show, by the way, Maria Bamford has. Ariel describes herself as a politically non-binary lesbian, and she has uh, lately positioned herself firmly on the third rail of comedy, if not all of culture, because she makes jokes about gender. Lots of them. In fact, she has a new special called Ellen DeGenderless, which just premiered on YouTube and in which she covers gender identity, sexuality, pronouns, social issues, and pop culture. In this conversation, we talk about all of that stuff, plus the sexual dynamics of comedy and the world of comedians. We talk at some length about her friendship with Louis C.K., who she toured with and whose uh, peccadilloes she's thought about a lot and uh, has some pretty surprising things to say about. I first became acquainted with Ariel when she visited our Unspeakeasy retreat in Austin last month to talk about how she creates comedy that's actually funny in this climate. We have uh, a humor crisis going on, according to many people. So we uh, pick up on some of that here in this conversation. As always, paying subscribers get to hear the whole interview, including the Louis C.K. part. If you are not yet a paying subscriber, you're not going to hear that part. So go to megandom.substack.com and join our listener community. In the meantime, I'm going to play a short clip from Ariel's stand-up so you get the idea and then proceed with the interview. I think I'm gender fluid. Now that we have the terms, I think I, that describes me. And if anyone doesn't know what gender fluid means, all it is is that if someone's hot enough, I'll change my pronouns to whichever ones they're attracted to. <laughs> y'all about something tonight. I I think they're, they're just two genders. Just two. Just cat people and dog people. That's <laughs> the only ones that count, okay? I know, I know there are people that are just snakes and birds or whatever, but it's like, yeah, is that another gender? Or are those people just autistic? <laughs> my position on things. I, I, I surprise people. I surprise people with a lot of my political it's like with abortion, I'm always surprised because I am not pro-choice. Yeah, I'm not pro-life either. Okay. No, I think we should terminate every pregnancy unless it starts when both parents come. <laughs> <laughs> I realize none of us would be here, but <laughs> then if we do something about global warming, let's just. <laughs> Ariel Isaac Norman, welcome to The Unspeakable. Thanks. You are known to me and um, at least a handful of uh, 
people who are probably listening because you were the special guest at our recent unspeakeasy sanity spa weekend free speech vacation in Austin. And you are a comic, a comedian based in Austin. And you did something that uh, I feel like um, is, is perhaps a cardinal sin of all <laughs> joke telling, which is that you explained your jokes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You, yeah. you you came to us and explained explained your humor and um you managed to do so in a way that was extremely funny and also extremely fascinating. So I thought we would maybe start by um you're you're talking about what in God's name possessed you to to explain your jokes and, and how you managed to pull it off. Oh, that's interesting. I guess I, I didn't think about it as explaining my jokes beforehand, but now I'm I feel like you're kind of uh, calling me the, the pen and teller of, of comedy. So pen and teller explained their, their jokes? Pen and teller explained their magic tricks. Like that's kind of their whole shtick is, is like breaking down how magic tricks work and breaking that rule of like that the magicians never explain their, their tricks. Yeah. And then they have this show where people try to see if they can do a magic trick that actually fools them. But if Penn and Teller are able to explain to them how their own trick worked, then they lose the competition. Okay. Okay. So you describe yourself as a politically non-binary comedian. Yeah. Uh, as well as in, in other ways. So why don't you uh, kind of tell us sort of who you are, what kind of humor do you do? Explain yourself, if not your jokes. Yeah, no, I it's interesting. I just I'm spending time with my girlfriend's family right now and they're Chinese, but they speak varying levels of English and they watched me do comedy for the first time and her dad and they're both like artists and like really brilliant people and her dad after my comedy was like you're funny, but you're also intellectual. You're it's, it's very unique. I like that, you know. And so I, I have a lot to say. I have a lot of ideas. Like I got into comedy inspired by people like George Carlin and Bill Hicks, who it wasn't always about how much am I laughing while listening to them. It's like how much thought provocation is happening. And so that's what inspires me, that those people helped me to break out of my Mormon framework that I grew up in. So for my, and this is, goes back to your question about like why I would explain my jokes to your unspeakablies or whatever you call your listeners. Unspeakies, yes. Un the, the secret cabal yeah. of... You don't ladies. like uns unspeakablies? Okay. Oh. Well, it doesn't work on that. It's kind okay. of a tongue twister. All right. So what a lot of my jokes... Some comics are up there just, just telling jokes. You have the setup and then you have the twist. And a lot of what I do is more saying things that I believe, but in a funny way. I use little funny phrases. You know, the timing is important, but it's like I word things in a, in a way that gets people to laugh at what are really just kind of good ideas or good points. And then it's when I actually do tell a joke that I don't mean, when I'm actually kidding, I oftentimes in my stand-up have to be like, that was a joke <laughs> to, to the audience. <laughs> yeah, depending on how, how uptight they are. Some people will naturally get it. But that's, you know, because I do have things that I want to say and communicate. And, and I want, like, to me, one of the things that comedy can really do is to debug people's thinking. We have hypocrisies that we haven't examined. We have just moral blind spots, things like that. And so you can use humor to get inside people's heads and show them what they haven't seen about their own logic, what they haven't paid attention to. But if you just explain it to people, they're not very receptive. So you have to make them laugh while you're doing it. Right. And also, if you if someone decides that your politics are quite different than theirs, then they're not going to be as receptive to even hearing your jokes. So I like to bob and weave and keep people guessing and never really understanding what my politics might be. And in fact, I don't really have politics such as, you know, so to speak, like the way people are like, either liberal or conservative or Democrat or Republican or even libertarian. Like, I just don't see anything that way. It's like Chris Rock said a long time ago, that's like, I got some shit I'm conservative about. I got some shit I'm liberal about. I think for him, he said, prostitution, I'm liberal, <laughs> you know. 
I can't remember what he's conservative about, but but that's to me, that's how comedians should be. We should be questioning everything. We shouldn't be like on one side or another. It's we're like independent thinkers who question things. And so when I walk on stage and people see, oh, this is probably some kind of they them vegan, then I'll use that assumption and play off of that and show them, okay, that's not what's going on. But then I got to kind of comfort the liberals, like I'm still on your side. (laughs) And then I kind of got to, so I keep going back and forth in my jokes, getting people to think, oh, okay, this person, either way, this person agrees with my politics more or less. And then I can tell the joke that will allow them to see a different perspective from what they have. Okay. So I can't remember exactly how old you are, but I'm curious when you were growing up and you were following all these comics and thinking you might want to be a comedian, what was the climate? Like, was there the feeling that you could just, you could make jokes and people would understand that they were jokes? Like how, (laughs) what was the sort of sense of humor quotient when you were coming of age? Oh yeah. I'm 37. So when I was growing up, there was no sense of well, you can't say something. I mean, we did have, you know, Bill Maher's Politically Correct was on TV at some point when I was growing up. And, uh, you know, after 9-11, he got in trouble for saying something about how, well, I guess it is kind of brave to... Cowardly was, acts. That's yeah, right. Yeah, because he was... Someone on his show, he agreed with someone on his show who said that, you know, it's not really cowardly to throw your life away thinking that you'll be rewarded for it afterwards and you're doing the Lord's work. Right. So those things were happening. That's like, you know, 2001, 2002. But so I guess, and that is about when I discovered stand up was right around that time. But I was listening to it on this sort of Yahoo had a radio player thing that, that started giving me stand up. And so everything that I was listening to was either a few years or a decade or two old. And so I was listening to very, I think it was completely free times in the 80s and 90s when people were doing stand-up. I don't think anybody had a sense of, you can't talk about this, that, or the other. So I was listening to, yeah, really unfiltered thoughts. And and But I was, you know, I had grown up Mormon, so I had had very kind of sheltered, you know, I hadn't, I hadn't heard a lot of things. <laughs> and so I was listening to, you know, jokes about abortion suddenly and you know, abortion had been just a completely evil thing to me. And now I was listening to people make jokes that were so far afield from anything I would have ever heard, just really like crude, but it was so funny and they were making really good points. And so I was just broken free of like all kinds of like prisons of just ideas that I'd never encountered and just was so excited to realize like, Oh, this is incredibly mind expanding to have to be able to just listen to someone else's thoughts on these topics that I totally disagree with them about, but I'm learning other perspectives. Wow. So you grew up Mormon. Were you like listening to this Yahoo radio comedy like in secret? Like, did you have to hide this from your family? No, I mean, my family is somewhat liberal as Mormons go, but I didn't, I certainly didn't listen to it in front of them. This was, that was all when I was a senior in high school. So at this point, I was the only kid at home and we had an upstairs and a downstairs and my parents were mostly downstairs and like, they had been very strict for most of my childhood. But finally, by this year, I did have some more freedom to just do my own thing. So I was just upstairs listening to stuff. And maybe I had headphones. I don't, I don't even remember. But I, so, you know, because at first that radio player was just playing music. It was just a music thing. I was playing like Diablo 2 while I would listen to music. And they did a great job showing me music that I liked. But then one day it just offered up some stand up, And I was like, whoa. And I just rated that the highest rating you could. And then it started giving me more stand up. And I just kept rating every stand up at like more and more and more of that. And then so it became like my music slash comedy radio. But I was just up there listening to it myself. So I remember one time I was, I wanted to listen to stand up years before this, I think. I wanted to listen to some stand up when I was visiting an, an aunt and uncle. And I had a cousin who's four years younger. And we just wanted to listen to stand up, but I had no idea. So we just picked up what, uh, Margaret Cho, 
having no idea who she was. And we started listening to it, but it was so dirty. My uncle, who's not, he's not particularly reserved. He's not a pearl clutcher, but you know, my cousin was four years younger. Maybe I was 15 and she was 11. I'm not sure. And so we were watching it. It was like, uh, we got to turn this off. <laughs> we can't. So, you know, stand up. I did see stand up as kind of like, oh, this is definitely a bit of an adult thing. But my parents, yeah, never listened to anything because they, they definitely wouldn't have. If they had heard what I was listening to, it wouldn't have been OK. But they just didn't. Right. Hear. So, OK, so we should say that your Twitter handle is hot Hannah Gadsby. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm wondering if Hannah Gadsby sort of marks the kind of threshold, the sort of before times and after times threshold in terms of like either being allowed to be funny or what is even considered comedy. Maybe it predates her. I don't know what pronouns she goes by. But okay, was it maybe, was it like 2018 or so that her stand-up special uh, sort of emerged? When did she come about and was that sort of like when everything changed and we were suddenly, quote unquote, not allowed to be funny? <laughs> That's an interesting framing of it. Okay. It's, yeah, it came out in 2018. Okay. N- Nanette, right? Was that the Nanette, first one? That's Nanette right. was the yes. first one. Yes. Okay. From my experience of that was that she was coming out and saying like, I don't have to be funny. Like, I don't, not everything I do has to be funny. Like, and she even kind of said she was going to quit stand up or something. And she was just saying, like, not everything in life is funny. And so sometimes I'm going to say some real things up here. But then she would have punchlines as well. She would go back and forth between a little bit of a like sermon and then jokes, good punchlines. And so I never took that as, like we're not supposed to be funny anymore. I just took that as okay, this is just someone doing something a little different with stand up, but it's always been kind of that way. If you go back and listen to Bill Hicks, a lot of the times he's really just, you know, speaking from his heart and you know, it'll be it can be a few minutes between laughs and but then he might go into something where he's making you laugh uproariously for a few minutes in a row and then he'll kind of go back to, you know, complaining about the culture and it it's it wasn't always laughs per minute. There's so many different styles of stand up, and I I just I have no problem with people doing all kinds of different types of stand up. It's really just you're given a microphone. Can you make people entertained for however long? They don't. It's you know doesn't. No one's got a laugh meter out there. And if you watch Chappelle in many of his specials, it's also like that. It's very similar to Hannah where. He'll go on for a while talking about stuff, kind of getting serious. And then he might tell a five-minute story, and then there's one punchline at the end. And now, if you disregard his last special, where it's hardly funny at all, then he did that successfully for a few specials. So it's like the same people who would criticize Hannah Gatsby. A lot of them love Chappelle and vice versa. And I'm like, you guys can't see that you guys both have somebody who's kind of doing the same thing. This can get somewhat preachy, sermon-like. And then there's punchlines. So, okay. Yeah. All right. That's fair. I And I have to say, I when Nanette first came out, I thought it was super interesting. I was yeah. actually like four. I was all for it. And I was excited about Hannah Gadsby. It does seem like she has sort of been fairly or unfairly kind of um, declared the... Uh, the buzzkill of the of the comedy world. Yeah, and I could see that. I'm not sure. I because I remember I watched the the, se- the special that came out after Nanette, some kind of dog's name or something, and then and I liked that as well. But I haven't seen her more recent work. I think she maybe did just put out a special. No, she just put out something where she kind of just put a little bit of a woke array of comics out on Netflix, like Hannah Gatsby presents. So I could, and, and I think she did change her pronouns to they, them or she, they or something. So I think it's just maybe a little bit of a retroactive labeling that we do of her now is like, ugh, this kind of buzzkill like you're saying. But at first those specials, they were just funny and interesting. I mean, she was talking about assaults and, you know, some of the, some of the darker parts of being a woman or being gay it was still funny. It was still just because, you know, it was almost like a joke that she was saying it wasn't going to be stand up because it was still stand up. But I think, you know, maybe she has drifted toward, as many people have kind of drifted in our polarized times, maybe she's drifted a little bit toward being a, 
you know, not on, not on the fun side of history. Well, okay, and we should say that um, her special uh, from 2019 was called Douglas. Maybe right. that's the one you were thinking of. And it really had a lot to do with they, I guess she goes by they, their autism diagnosis. Oh, right, yeah. And um, kind of talking about n- neurodiversity and, you know, obviously the intersection between humor and neurodivergence. There's a lot there. Yeah, and she, if I recall, she also, in, in those two specials at least, has some stuff. She does really cool callbacks. She has through lines. Like, she's doing some kind of, you know, artistic stuff with her stand-up specials that I really admire. And so it's stuff that, you know, a lot of comics, there's, it's, I feel like we've gotten a little bit lazier. I think in older times, American comics did used to have more, like, constructed stand-up specials. And some people still do that. But for a lot of people, it's just joke, 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 end. And so she was, you know, doing things that were a little bit more constructed. And I thought that was really cool. But the, and I forgot that 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 whole thing was about neurodiversity and whatnot, because that's part of why I use the, the Twitter handle Hot Hannah Gatsby, because I'm like, yeah, you know, you can be a little autistic and people don't really realize like because she looks like she does. People are like, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. You're, you're a little autistic, aren't you? But for me, if I say I'm a little autistic, a lot of times people are like, mm, no, you're not. Or, or they'll be like, no, you're not. Don't say that. Or, or whichever. <laughs> are you a little autistic? I mean, I think so. I think, but if you meet comics, like a lot of us are definitely on some spectrums. You know, we... <laughs> <laughs> the nar- the uh, the substance abuse uh, spectrum. We're or the, on that. The narcissism spectrum. Narci- yeah, I, th- I'm on, I hate to brag, but I'm on all the spectrums. Yeah. Personally, yeah. <laughs> Okay, but like, it seems, you know, you reached out to me because you were interested in in what I was doing. And, you know, it does seem like you are really wanting to, quote unquote, interrogate what has happened to people's perceptions of humor, um, how receptive they are to it, their ability to withstand kind of, you know, edgy or dark or uncomfortable humor. I mean, what do you think is going on with people? And what do you think is the is the cause? What do I think is going on with people's sense of humor? And what is the cause? Okay. For one thing, I think things have gotten better. I think that our heyday of censoriousness and self-censoriousness was... 2018 to 2022. I think that chunk of time was probably the top of the mountain on that because I've seen a shift even in the last year and a half or so of people getting their senses of humor back. But people were afraid. I mean, it was crazy there for a long time. And it still is crazy to some extent, the way that we just couldn't talk about, you know, and it drifted, I think, from the kind of 2012-ish on to 2018, it was growing that you started learning that if you said the wrong thing around the wrong person, and and that included on the internet pretty much always, because the wrong person could always see it if it was on the internet and then it could get amplified. And until Elon Musk bought Twitter, you know, Twitter was particularly this place where people realized that they could have outsized power to, you know, get people, you know, canceled or punished socially by, you know, you could blow them up. And, and so we did kind of create a weird, you know, our own version of a cultural revolution where the craziest people, the most censorious people could be so loud that they were able to get so many of us to shut up and not say things. And it was hard to see that it wasn't the majority of people. It really felt like a huge pop- percent of the population all felt the same way, that that they didn't want you to have all kinds of opinions about well, anything, anything that's been politicized. I mean, particularly, of course, the gender stuff, but also race. Um, if you even were abortion, it'd be, you know, anything that was the polit- politicized and polarized, it was if you said the wrong thing, quote unquote, then these powerful forces, and particularly on the left, you know, that's where you have 
most of corporate media and then social media, young people really knowing how to use those tools to amplify themselves and get a bunch of people to kind of tell you how bad you are. And people were losing their jobs. I mean, so we all kind of learned you got to be really careful what you say, but even what you laugh at. Like if you're in a room and you know, there's some people, and even just last night, I was doing a comedy show here in Richmond and I was looking around the show and I was like, I think this person in the front row might be trans. Like I couldn't tell if it was just a 55 year old dude who'd grown his hair out really long, (laughs) (laughs) which, you know, or a 55 year old woman, you know, let's face Uh, it. Yes. Yeah. Like I couldn't tell. I, I mean, I knew it was a penis person, but I couldn't tell if they thought they were a woman or we're just a dude with long, who'd grown his hair out. And so then I'm like, "Mm, I'm going to redo my whole set, (laughs) you know? Oh, wow. I'm I'm not going to do those jokes. I mean, it'd be one thing if they were just in the back, but not in the front row. I'm not going to do that. That would feel crazy to sit there and talk about like, you know, like fucked up jokes about the nuances of which trans people are legit or not. I'm not going to do that with this person in the front row. And that's kind of how it felt. It felt like, The front rows of society are just filled with the most punishing woke people who are there with their, you know, they're ready to write the article about you. They're ready, whether you're in person and they're going to write the article about you or you're saying something and they're going to retweet you and and write, you know, whatever. Like, that's just, everyone kind of had the sense that if they had a dissenting thought, they were in the minority. And the reality is, we never were in the minority. It's just that the people who are the loudest are in the are on the far left and also on the far right. But, you know, you and I don't walk in those circles as much and they weren't as kind of, they weren't as adept at using Twitter to get their way. Yeah. And also, if you got attacked by the far right, that was like a feather in your cap, right? It, it, yeah, I mean, exactly. You can, I mean, I've said this many times, you can only be canceled by your own side. Right. So there was nothing that like, you know, Jerry Falwell was going to do to to hurt Uh, Right. That would only help us. Lefty comedian. Yeah. Well, I I mean, I often get so sad when I think about, for instance, comedians like Sarah Silverman, you know, Mm. who was like doing such, you know, I hate to use the word edgy all the time. I sound like... No, but it was edgy. It's a boomer thing. That was her um, thing, though. She was doing this kind of, you know, humor, like, you know... And she could be just as edgy as the boys. And it was, and it was really smart, you know? I mean, yeah. And then you in the last, you know, eight years, something, she's just kind of become a little bit of, almost just kind of like apologetic. Well, she's even said there are jokes that I wouldn't do anymore. I mean, she would, right. ha- she had jokes, in, you know, in the early, in, in the 90s, like, uh, uh, you know, I, <laughs> I was like, I was raped by my doctor, which is so bittersweet for, for a, a Jewish Jew. girl, you know, <laughs> like, just stuff. And, um just jokes about AIDS and like her whole persona was of a clueless sort of, you know, right. But it was a persona. white girl. Yeah. And it worked. And to see her kind of almost denouncing herself, I don't know how sincere it is. I don't know exactly where it's coming from. If it's like a hostage situation with some of these people, what do you think? I think it probably is. I haven't really seen much of her in a long time. I I, I hear little statements from her every now and then, but as far as I'm aware, I haven't seen her like working as a stand-up. I think you know she got into those kind of higher level, but also like certain social groups. Like she's hanging out with people like Samantha B and people who are on the TV stuff. You know, she was doing the TV stuff. And when you're doing TV, you got to be careful. <laughs> There's a lot of people you can't piss off. And then that's who you're hanging out with. And they're all kind of, it's like, I, I don't really, res- you can't really respect comics that much who are doing the TV thing. I remember years ago, Tim Dillon, like ranting about how funny it is that like, you know, he has friends who are like bragging about being on TV and stuff. He's like, there's not even a good credit anymore. It's like embarrassing to be on TV. And it's exactly (laughs) right. Like having a TV, it's, it's like some of the worst content happens on there. And we all know they have to do all kinds of bullshit. And especially the, the comedians who they have doing news related stuff. It's like, 
there's all this propaganda that they're forced to say, and they're sitting there talking about Venezuela as if they really understand. Oh, you whether, mean like the late night guys? Yeah, I don't, whether it's Trevor Noah or if it's John Oliver, anything. And and it's so sad because people trust them because we trust comedians because there's <laughs> there's truth in comedy. Like we all know that comedy gets <laughs> we to trust truth. Comedians to deliver the news. We do. Well, after John Stewart, which you know, God bless him, he did a lot of good, but it also led to this culture of like, well, that's who we can trust to get our news from because everybody else is lying. But now we have all these comedians who are just kind of shills for the establishment, who are just doing whatever, you know, whatever propaganda. They, so like they'll do jokes and some stuff that, you know, ha ha, let's make fun of the, the, to, of the right. And then they sneak in stuff, you know, about foreign policy things that are absolutely just what the U.S. government wants you to believe, but isn't true. And people are just like, oh, OK, that must be true. Here's our trusted comedians we're listening to. And so the whole TV apparatus is just, you know, everyone's full of shit. And you have publicity people, you know, PR people who are writing statements for you and things. I mean, who even knows what Sarah Silverman even, yeah, really believes? Like, I don't think any of those people really believe their bullshit, you know, there's all these apologies and stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm glad. I think maybe the apology days are getting toward an end, too. How about you see less of these weird apology statements? Maybe. Uh, I Maybe mean, I'm always optimistic. I don't know. I mean, depends on depends on what genre you're talking about. I mean, I want to get back to John Stewart for a second. I mean, that that's curious because you say he did a lot of good. The show was definitely you know hugely important. I watched it every night, like everyone else. The Daily Show. You know, through the, the Colbert, through the, odds, so through fun. the Bush administration. Oh, Colbert was like a tour de force. Yeah, um, I got to the point where I yeah only watched Colbert and didn't yeah, really watch yeah, Jon Stewart as much. Same. Yeah. yeah, but like now, you know, to see Jon Stewart come back and you know he's really he's just all over the place, and he it's either it seems like he's either just reciting talking points or he's being handed material from like much younger staff or writers mm-hmm. or he's got somebody whispering in his ear right. and it's, you know, he's come under a lot of uh, criticism for this, but like, I, I wonder what you think of like somebody in, in his position, like what's going on there? Well, what I could only imagine is you, you can't know and understand every topic. And if we're going to look to one person as the voice that we're going to listen to, then he's going to have to have a team of people who are feeding him some of the answers. He can't, he can't fully deeply understand all these topics and make sure that he's discussing them with truth and integrity. And so instead, you know, he has people telling him, he's like, oh yeah, wait, what's going on with puberty blockers? And then his helpful younger staff and the, whatever people, and they're like, here you go. And they could give him all the talking points and then, and write little jokes around it. And so he doesn't know, he hasn't read all the books that you and but I he have should, read. But don't you think he should, <laughs> he should know, like he doesn't need to know, like, you know, he's not in a rabbit hole on every subject, but I feel like if you're going to be out there in the world talking publicly you need to have some kind of point of view that's coming from you. Absolutely. I no, I think it's wrong. I mean, I think that I haven't been watching his new show, so I no. don't know exactly you're, how you're, you're not alone there. Right. <laughs> right. So I don't know the kind of tenor of how he's presenting himself. Um, I've glanced, uh, you know, uh, someone I lived with for a minute would, would often listen to his podcast that he was doing in the intervening years between his shows and it was generally kind of annoying and woke to me when I would when when I would hear it. But, you know, yeah, I think it's I think he absolutely should say should come to these things with more of a like, no, no I'm not going to listen to your talking points like present me kind of both sides of things or multiple sides of things like or, you know, have guests on. And then and then like if I'm having a discussion with someone about a controversial topic you should be, you ask good questions. You say, oh, I see your point there, but what about this? And I'm not seeing that from him. I'm not seeing him go like, let's actually question. There are obvious questions to ask about, especially anything related to the gender stuff. You know, there's obvious questions to ask at every turn. And people act like there aren't obvious questions because 
people got in trouble for so long for just asking questions. And even even trying to write, like, this is a cancelable phrase, at least in, in, you know, some of my circles, even saying that we're just trying to ask questions. Right. That's also <laughs> wrong well, thing. Yeah. Well, that's right coded. That's right. That's right. That's what Glenn Beck yes. did. And that, questions you know. and free speech and whatever right. is all, all on the right, which like, OK, like if you guys want to say that that's on the right, you're going to push a lot of people to the right. Yeah. I mean, the other thing about Jon Stewart, too, was that, you know, he is now being sort of, you know, his his whole shtick is being revisited now. And people are saying, like, that kind of smirking, Mm -hmm. you know, relentlessly mocking sort of irony-laden humor. It's not even irony. I mean, irony was like the David Letterman era. Like, Jon Stewart was just, you know, just constantly arched eyebrow and, you know, just schadenfreude at idiots on the right. right. It it kind of, it was entertaining at the time, but it was pretty insidious. Right. And I feel like it set us back as a culture. Yeah, I think he could have pulled back on it a little bit and that would have been better. I mean, it was a different time. It's kind of like when the new atheists were in their heyday. Well, we didn't really did have a, a religiosity problem, but the atheists just went too far. And... You seem a little bit like Neil deGrasse Tyson explaining that there's no Santa to children, <laughs> you know, like, okay, but it's, you're so smart, but like God was serving some purposes. And with Stewart, it's like, we kind of needed, the Republicans did kind of have a lot of power for a while. And the culture was quite kind of conservative and religious. Like there was a lot that uh, it really did feel like the right had a lot of power. And so it made sense to be mocking them and mocking, you know, Fox News had become this big thing for people. It was like, so, so much of the country was just listening to Fox News. So now we do need to kind of like balance things out by making fun of it. And he would make fun of the left too, to some extent. And, but, you know, there was probably more to make fun of on the right at the time. The religious right right, had gone crazy. They had, you know, taken things, their positions on abortion and climate change were these constructed things that were politically expedient that had developed that were never really conservative positions. And now they had become, you know, this party of, of weird science denial and things. And so it made sense to make fun of them. But I think once we got Rachel Maddow, that's when it really (laughs) went downhill because she's just, I mean, she's not as funny and she's more just snarky. And like, you don't think she's a comic genius? What do you mean? <laughs> you know, I just, and it was crazy as a, as a lesbian, you know, how many people just wanted to suck her dick so badly. I'm like, <laughs> I, mean, for, I liked her Wait, too, like a long saying? time ago. <laughs> she's, uh, she's got something we don't know about. No, it's just, you know. Yeah. No, it was exciting. I mean, I re- seeing Rachel Maddow on the air, like in such a prominent way, was. Like, it was cool like amazing beginning. to see. Like yeah. you just never saw somebody like that in the way she was. I don't know if she was immediately accepted, but she was pretty widely accepted yeah. by a wide range of people. Yeah, she was. And then, you know, and I used to tune into her every now and then or watch some clip of this, that, or the other and enjoy it. But then, you know, one day I was watching something. I'm like, this is propaganda. This is not true. And she's saying it and she's so just adamant about everything she's so sure about everything she says and it's just so obvious and the republicans are just such idiots and i mean you know by the time it got to covid obviously famously completely insane you know she's sitting there telling us that the vaccines are going to work you know 100 percent. there's not going to be any consequences you're gonna it'll never you'll never be able to spread it you know blah 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 and like all the different back and forth that she had but it's like she's clearly just being fed stuff and she's just good at you know um acting cocksure about (laughs) to bring that back in (laughs) about whatever she's told that she should believe and i think that's really destructive because so many people were already in love with her and then it started becoming more crazier propaganda. I mean, is it too much to ask of these people in these very mainstream, highly paid positions to have an opinion? I mean, going back to someone like Stephen Colbert, I mean, he was so brilliant what he was doing. The, you know, the Colbert report report yeah. was making fun of Bill O'Reilly. Like that yeah. was the original shtick. And, th- you know, the way he was able to sustain that over the course of the show and yet still do interviews, it was, it was amazing. And he has become absolutely milk toast. And yeah. you have to wonder 
what is going on there? Like, do these, do they really like not want to lose their jobs so badly? Or are they so addicted to their paychecks and really thinking that they will never get another paycheck from any other source if they don't keep doing this? Not only their paychecks, but the status. I mean, you know, they grew up in a time when these kinds of jobs were the most prestigious. Now, again, like Tim Dillon said, like we all make fun of them. But, you know, because I remember my mom really falling in love. She'd never watched the Colbert Report. She didn't know anything about that. But like when, once he got his late night show, she found him. And he kind of looks like her oldest son who passed away. And so I think that's part of why she fell in love with him so much. But she loved him and would just tell me, she's like, I love this comedian. And some, she would see comedians on there. It was like a way for her to connect with me. But then, and I was always like, okay, I'm I'm not going to like criticize this too much because I'm glad that she's found Colbert, you know, but then about a year ago, she was like, mm, I've stopped listening to him. It's, it was just feeling like propaganda. I'm like, wow. wow. From my mom. I'm like, okay. So yeah, I, I, I don't know if they just don't see it, but I think people absolutely get used to the paycheck. It's a huge paycheck. And they also get used to the status and they, and they grew up at the, in the time where, you know, it's like, he's Johnny Carson now. And they don't realize, you know, how many of us just really roll our eyes at them and they're still getting the paycheck. But, you know, and there's audience capture and that happens, you know, for crazy YouTubers and podcasters. But it also happens for these people who that's they get that love and they go to these parties and people love them. You know, the people who are on that team love them. And I mean, I think audience capture is one of the most fascinating parts of our polarized political world because it's so real and it's so dangerous. Anybody like even you or I like have to maintain vigilance that we don't just start giving people what they want. Yeah. I try to do a really bad show like every four shows, <laughs> yeah, exactly. every four episodes. So they turn on me and leave do you know me about, and start you know all about, over again. <laughs> yeah. Do you know about Nico Cotto Avocado? No. <laughs> this guy... He was doing this YouTube stuff of just, I, he did all kinds of interesting stuff before. I think like science things and whatever. He was really interested in stuff and he was always making these these cool videos, but no one ever watched them. And then one day he starts just eating on, on video. Like he starts eating like a lot of food. It would be, you know, those, what's, what's the term for when you are just eating a bunch of food on oh, camera. Oh, like competitive eating contests? Like <laughs> yeah, hot dog no, eating the, contests? The, the, yeah, but no, but the kids have a term for when you, a bunch of, if anybody young is listening to this, they're yelling at us right now, but there's a term for when you just eat a ton of food on camera just oh, because it entertains nope. people. Not yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. I learned it like last night. And so you eat all this food and like people would watch those. It's just, it's a, it became like a popular style of YouTube video. And so this guy starts eating all kinds of crazy food, just tons of it. And like, that's what gets views. That finally it gets all these views. And so he just eats more and more crazier, crazier things to the point where he's gained like 300 pounds. Oh, and nice. He's, he's, he's dating a woman who's even larger than he Wait. is. And the two of them... <laughs> Okay, this is called a mukbang. Mukbang, yes, thank you. Mukbang. It's a Korean <laughs> term, right? Apparently, yeah, because they, they have ones where you can just watch people eat, and then it took on this <sighs> life of because some people would just watch them when they're eating alone to not feel alone, just watching a, a woman eat dinner. But then there's also oh these God. videos where people eat just tons of food, and then people because you know people watch crazy shit online for entertainment, and these people feel loved. But everyone is going, so like last night we watched a video where this guy and his even more enormous girlfriend are eating and they'll kind of talk about their old videos and how skinny he used to be. And, and the top comment that you see is, this is someone being like, anybody else just check in on this guy every few months to see if he's still alive. (laughs) And it's like, yeah, dude, like you're getting all these likes and all these views and all whatever, and maybe money. I think they're getting all this money, but everyone's making fun of you. Like, I don't think, I think a lot of Dylan Mulvaney's views and follows are ironic ones. I think people are entertained oh, by watching. Oh, they're hate follows. Yeah, they're hate most, views. most probably, right? Even the people saying, you're so beautiful, brave, are just like, we're just gaslighting this person so that they'll keep doing it because it's so entertaining to watch someone just do woman face for, for yeah. the in- Instagram fame. And it feels really good to be angry about Dylan Mulvaney. Right. It feels so fun to like righteously despise this person. Yeah, because also it, you can feel, you can hate them, but not feel guilty because like this is a person that is, you know, is, this is a white male, right? right. So they're yeah. already in an elevated privileged position. So we can 
you know, inveigh against them. Yeah. But he, I mean, I, I cannot stand him. I don't, well, I think that he's grifting us. Uh, my, absolutely. I don't think view. he's doing it consciously. He's just a narcissist who's barely aware of what he's doing. And he's just going to keep, again, it's audience capture. He's basically Nico Cotto of avocado. You know, it's like, oh, because Don't cause tell used, him that though. He's, yeah. The, the anorexic version. Exactly. He's the anorexic. Well, he's always been anorexic, I think. But then, you know, he used to do all kinds of stuff. I think he was doing, you know, Broadway. I think that yeah, he was in the Book of Mormon. Mormon, He was in the Book of Mormon. You should know as a Mormon. No, I did. I know. He was in the Book of Mormon, but not the original cast, right? It was like a later one. I think he was in some kind of product. Yeah. No, but like a... You know, he was but he was in a doing stuff, but he never production. really got any fame or anything from that. I mean, he was on, you know, he was like in L.A. just signing up for stuff like Price is Right and he did the Ellen show. And so, yeah. So then finally he starts transitioning in this insane way on TikTok and that works. And so he's continued with it. And it's like and and I don't mind using he him pronouns, for you know, because I, I do use she her for people that like I think are. Or, you know, are like seem like women, like really feel like women. But I think this person is an insane person that we've all kind of encouraged the way we encourage Nico Cavo Avocado, Avocado, whatever, you know, and Nico Cato Avocado. And, uh, and, and it's wrong of us. And it, you know, you, you, I, it, but it's fun to laugh. And I've given him a few views. I try not to <laughs> give too many, but then you want to show people. But really, all we're doing is, you know, enjoying what, but nobody has done more harm to the trans community than Dylan Mulvaney, probably. Oh, well, it depends on how far you go. I mean, there's Andrea Long Chu. Well, that's, there's yeah, a, but not, she doesn't influence as many people. No, not at all. Not at all. Or like, he, yes, I'm going to go he on d- Definitely le- levels, of, levels of harm. Yeah. Dylan Mulvaney. Well, I, I call Dylan Mulvaney a transorexic. Transorexic. Yeah. Because he's clearly... Anorexic. That's person. the most womanly thing about him, sadly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. When you, if you can hate yourself enough. Uh, then you, you feel like you're you, a woman. You've yeah. got your, your bona fides. Okay. Well, so you have um, you have opened for uh, a lot of big names. Maria Bamford, who's been a guest on this podcast, I should say. Tim Dillon, Eddie Papatone, and uh, perhaps most notably, one Louis C.K. That's right. And uh, I know that you... Um, you were friendly with him at one time or you had a, a friendship. I don't know how much you want to talk about him or your your relationship or your thoughts about his career, everything. But yeah, where, where to start? Okay. Yeah, no, I worked with Louis not too long ago. He is probably retired. That was the first part of my conversation with comedian Ariel Isaac Norman. If you want to hear the rest, which I suspect you do, become a paying subscriber at megandom.substack.com. You'll be able to hear the whole thing. Otherwise, Ariel is an Austin-based comedian. She uh, has a new special. It's called Ellen DeGenderless. It's now streaming on YouTube. You can find Ariel on Instagram at at Ellen DeGenderless and on YouTube or Spotify at Politically Non-Binary. That is it for now. I will be back next week with another super nuanced guest. Thanks for listening. See you then. 